Hi everyone, we're going to continue now talking about the energy of um, electrons in an atom or an ion. In the previous uh, couple of videos we talked about the energy of one electron systems um, where there's only one electron in either the atom or the ion. And remember when I talked about this at the introduction to this topic I said that this is not very useful because it only allows us to calculate energy of systems that um, are not very interesting uh, aside from the hydrogen atom helium plus, lithium 2 plus, those are not very interesting systems because we don't see a lot of them but we are very interested in understanding how to calculate the energy of polyelectronic systems which is helium, lithium, sodium atom ions of these, sodium plus for example and those contain more than one electron and this is really where quantum mechanics shine and just um, you know, can calculate the energy of all of these systems and the Bohr model can't. And this is why we eventually switch over to quantum mechanics because that's really the model that allows us to make predictions on these systems. So in this class again we don't really have the mathematical uh, sophistication to make these calculations but we can still understand the basis of this calculation by considering a couple of effects that are present in polyelectronic systems but not in one electron systems okay and the first one I want to talk about is something called uh, shielding uh, of outer electrons by inner electrons this is not necessarily a difficult concept to understand if you think about the following drawing right here okay so I'm just gonna make this a little bigger so you can see it a little bit better okay so what you notice here is that you see that there is a, a lithium uh, atom. Uh, I know it's lithium because the Z here or the uh, um, atomic number is 3. So the nucleus has a plus 3 charge. And uh, a lithium at atom, of course, has 3 electrons as well, right, because it's neutral. So then it has 3, Z equals 3, and there's 3 electrons in it okay what we mean by shielding is the following in the one electron case you remember that there's always only one electron so in other words there's no electron in between that one electron and the nucleus so if the electron is here and there's no other electron in between the nucleus and the electron that's on the outside then we're free to have uh, electrostatic interaction between the nucleus and the electron that's on the outside okay the difference here is that in a um, polyelectronic systems you don't have just one electron you have multiple electrons and these electrons are then placed into certain orbitals depending on which orbitals uh, we start with okay so remember that in the first level first principle quantum number first shell you can only have one orbital which is the 1s orbital and according to Pauli's exclusion principle you can only have a maximum of two electrons in that orbital which means that these two orbitals would then be in my 1s I mean these two electrons I should say would then be in my 1s orbital the second the third electron uh, can't cannot be in the shell number one anymore because there's no more space for it so it has to go to shell number two in the shell number two which is n equals two you can have either 2s or 2p and we'll talk about which which one this electron belongs to uh, later on but the point I want to make here is that this electron now is further away from the nucleus but not only that there are two electrons that are in between this electron and the nucleus because electrons repel each other these two electrons will then shield or block the interaction of this outer electrons with the nucleus and as a result if you don't have these two electrons the interaction that this electron will feel would be a plus three charge given these two electrons being present there the interaction that this electron will feel now it's sort of plus three minus some number of electron now on a very rough approximation you can say that this shielding effect is negative two because there are two electrons in there. In other words, it's minus one for each electron that is shielding the outer electron. So as a result, we have 
a plus one charge being felt by this electron as opposed to a plus three charge. That's a very different stability now in terms of energy, right? Because if it's a plus three charge, it's going to be a much stronger electrostatic interaction. If it's a plus one charge, it's a much weaker electrostatic interaction. So this electron then becomes very easily lost because the interaction that's holding this electron to the nucleus is very weak due to this electron shielding. So this is actually a good time to talk about now this concept of valence versus core electrons. You saw earlier in the in the example I just talked about uh, with regards to shielding that we have electrons that are located on the outside and electrons that are located on the inside. In other words, closer to the nucleus versus the electron that's located really far away from the nucleus. In a multi-electron system or a polyelectronic system, we have to differentiate between these two types of electron because the electrons that are really far away from the nucleus will experience the weakest attraction because of the shielding and as a result it's really easy to get rid of or lose these electrons okay so these electrons are then called valence electron the actual definition of a valence electron is all the electrons that are located in the outermost shell what do I mean by outermost shell what I mean is this is the shell or the level, the energy level, that has the largest principal quantum number. Okay, so if you're at shell 3, for example, where n is equal to 3, your principal quantum number is equal to 3, then all the electrons in the 3s, 3p, and 3d orbitals are counted as your valence electrons. Okay, so you understand that, that it's all the electrons in, at that level. It doesn't matter what orbitals they're in they're all considered the valence electrons okay as I said just now because these electrons are furthest away from the nucleus and because of shielding they have the weakest attraction to the nucleus because they have the weakest attraction it's very easy to lose these electrons by sharing with another uh, electrons from other elements or by giving this away thus forming a cation Core electrons, on the other hand, are basically all the electrons that are not valence electrons. So these are located closer to the nucleus, and because they're closer, they have stronger attraction to the nucleus, and as a result, they're more stable. If they're more stable, then it's harder to remove them, because then you need to put in more energy in order to remove the electrons from the atom. So here's a simple illustration of what valence versus core electrons are. So the red one here is your valence electron. All the blue ones are core electrons. Okay? And you can have more than one valence electron. You can have seven, you can have six, you can have five, whatever. But uh, in this particular drawing, it's just shown as one. So the second effect you want to think about as far as the multi-electron system that affects the energy of these electrons is something called orbital penetration. And the idea here is that some orbitals have have the ability to penetrate into the space of the core orbitals or the core the, the, the orbitals of the core electrons due to the difference in the wave function or the structures of these orbitals okay and in order to understand this concept it's really uh, best to think about this in terms of the radial probability curves of the various orbitals uh, because these curves come from the wave function itself of the each of these orbitals so as a result if we look at them we'll be able to understand or you'd be able to understand this concept of orbital penetration so I'm going to kind of blow this up a little bit in the next uh, slide and show you again this slide that I showed you uh, in the last topic when I was talking about radial probability representation and here I just want to point out 1s the radial probability, if you remember, is right here. So the 1s electron, as you can see, if I were to add up the probability of the 1s electron, basically meaning that I were, I were to calculate the area under this curve for the 1s, I'll get a value that's fairly close to the nucleus, right? Definitely closer to the nucleus when I compare that to the 2s or 2p. If the 1s is closer to the nucleus than the 2s or 2p, that means that the 1s electron 
or the one s orbital is the lower energy orbital is lower compared to both of these guys the question that we have to ask now is what about when we compare 2s versus 2p if you look at 2s the 2s orbital has this green probability plot okay so you have a, a big area here under this green curve and then you have a small area under this curve okay Remember, the total probability or the average probability of the 2s electrons would be the sum of these two areas, again, based on as a function of the distance that they are located next to the nucleus. You can compare that to the 2p, which is the one in red. And again, if you were to add all of these things together, the area under the curve of the red one, you're going to get a value right around here. Okay. The question is, what about the 2s? You might say, well, isn't it here? Isn't it right here at the peak of the 2s? It's not because you have this little bump here. And that little bump shifts this probability towards the nucleus because this bump is located pretty close to the nucleus. And as a result, if you were to add the probability of the curves for the green one, both the small one and the big one, you end up with an overall curve that has a maximum to the left of the 2p orbital plot. Now what does that mean? If it's to the left of the 2p orbital, that means it's closer to the nucleus because nucleus is located right here. So if the 2s is closer to the nucleus, that means the 2s orbital is more stable than the 2p orbital. Okay, so that's a really important concept here because what we just discovered is that in a multi electron system, the 2s orbital is actually more stable than the 2p orbital. Remember, that's not the case when we talked about a one electron system. When we talk about the one electron system, the 2s and the 2p have the same energies. They call degenerate, if you remember. Now, what we just talked about here is that because of this little bump here the 2s orbital is slightly shifted to the left of the 2p making it closer to nucleus and making it more stable this little bump here is what we refer to as that orbital penetration the reason it's called orbital penetration is because this 2p orbital has the ability to penetrate into the space that belongs to the 1s orbital Okay, so in other words, the 2s electron somehow has this ability to get into the space of the 1s uh, electron, but the 2p electron doesn't have that ability. The 2p electron, it just goes to zero when it goes into the 1s space. So that's what makes the 2s electron more stable than the 2p electron. So going back to this slide, I want to read off here what I wrote down. Because the shape of the sp, d, and f orbitals are different from another, electrons in the s orbital have a higher probability of being found close to the nucleus than electrons in the p orbital. In fact, the orbital, the s orbital can penetrate into the lower s orbitals, but the p orbital cannot. This is what we refer to as orbital penetration. As a result of penetration, right, this electron that was originally located here now it's a little bit closer to nucleus so the shielding effect is a little weaker for these guys and as a result their able their 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 um, uh, electrostatic interaction with the uh, with the nucleus is stronger making this electron the 2s more stable than a 2p electron